That praise yes, will sir. continually be in my mouth. Yes, yes. The humble will make his boast to the yes, Lord. Yes. The humble will hear thereof and be glad. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. Magnify the Lord. Oh, with yes. Me. yes. Yes. Rejoice his name. Let everything. Yes. Let everything. Hallelujah. Yes. Let everything. Thank yes. you, O oh God. That has breath. Thank you, O oh God. Praise the Lord. Yes, yes. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know he that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves, for we are his people, and the sheep of his pastures. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him. And bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth through all generations. I'm not so sure about you, Dr. Williams, but I'm so glad to be here in the house of the Lord this morning. But I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. The humble will make his boast in the Lord. The humble will hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and help me rejoice his name. Let everything, let everything, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. It's always a privilege to have this opportunity to share with God's people his word. I must share with you a brief story. Um, thanks for your kind words, homiletics professor. I remember in black preaching, she tricked me because, you know, she tricked me. She told me that she was going away when I was preaching my first sermon. And she came back, you know, and I, she, she just threw me off. She threw me off and, I mean, it was a wonderful sermon. And she came up to me and said, Mark, that was a great sermon, but I'm going to help you to find your own voice. Yeah. Um, she brought me in that room. She tore me down for an hour. <laughs> I mean, that's what a woman does. That's what a woman would do. So, it's always a privilege to be in God's house with God's people. And I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of this word. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. John 8, 1 through 11 the New American Standard Bible, and it reads, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple area, and all the people were coming to him, and he sat down and began teaching. Now the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in the act of adultery, and after placing her in the center of the courtyard, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? Now they were saving this to test him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground, when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Now when they heard this, they began leaving one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone and the woman where she was, in the center of the courtyard. And straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go. From now on, do not.
not sin any longer. Amen, amen. For the few minutes that we have, I'd like to share with you under the caption, caught but not condemned. Amen. Please be seated. <laughs> caught but not condemned. Dear Heavenly Father, take the little that I have and make it much. It's my prayer with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Caught, but not condemned. In the art of preaching, seasoned homileticians will tell you that a sermon should never be about the person who is preaching but about the one whom they have been called to speak about. Mm, oh yes. The preaching moment is a privilege to lift up the name that's above every other name, and that's Jesus Christ, our Lord. But forgive my willful disobedience this morning, because when I look at the person I once was and the person I became, I can't help but to give God thanks for where he has brought me from. Yeah. And I have a funny feeling or a sneaky suspicion that there are at least 10 folk at the Grace Place who can lift up their holy hands and testify if yeah. it had not been. For the Lord on our side, there would be no pastors and there would be no elders. There would be no executive committees. There would be no AMDs. There would be no praise teams. There would be no prayer teams. There would be no hospitality teams. There would be no media teams. And I'm just wondering, is there anybody here this morning who can give God, give God thanks and his mercy that he gave us mercy, but he did not grant us condemnation? Amen. And beloved, isn't this the theme of 1 John 8, 1 through 11? Jesus had just schooled the religious elites at Jerusalem. It is here we realize Jesus is not the lowly, meek, and mild savior of the Synoptic Gospels. They have failed in their attempt to arrest the word made flesh. And I'm not so sure about you, but in, at the end of chapter 7, you would have realized that the Pharisees were annoyed, aggravated, and disgruntled because the officers who had been sent to reprimand Jesus were amazed, astonished, and even hypnotized by the words of this extraordinary teacher. Mm. So Jesus left the excitement and confusion of the city. One writer stated that he left the eager crowds and malicious rabbis so that he could be alone with the Heavenly Father. Mm. So early in the morning, Jesus returned to the temple area, and all the people were coming to him. Jesus understood that he had a responsibility, not, watch this, not just to save, but to snatch men and women from the snares of religious wolves and theological discrepancies. So the Bible declares in verse 2 that he sat down and began teaching the people. This did not sit well with the scribes and Pharisees because this untrained, masterful theologian was, un was undermining the authority of those who had autonomy over the interpretation of the law of Moses. So the scribes and Pharisees brought a humiliated, vulnerable woman to the temple area who was discovered accidentally, suddenly, or even unexpectedly in the act of adultery. Now this may not mean much to you, this may not ring a bell, because you may not be aware of the socio-economic, cultural, and political realities of the time. During that patriarchal period, the structure of the temple had two main sections, the holy place and a woman's courtyard. So she was not brought to the temple for restoration. She was guided to the temple for condemnation. In other words, they brought her to the right building, to the right person, for the wrong reason. Beho beloved, it is here in the text that John helps us to realize the religious elites prioritized public castigation over spiritual edification. It's right here in the text. The Bible says, now the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in the act of adultery after placing her in the center of the courtyard. And they said to him sarcastically, 
Teacher, this woman has been caught in the very act of adultery. And while I was ruminating and thinking over this text, I couldn't, I, I couldn't help but ask the question, Jill, have you ever been to a temple that had a courtyard? What would you do if your shameful past was revealed right before you? What would you do if you were guided to a place of edification but received public humiliation? Now this may not ring a bell, but you must understand, Jesus came at a time of decline for the Jews. He himself was a marginalized Jew. Yeah, yeah. Whenever you're reading the Bible, you must understand that Jesus is speaking on, the, on behalf of the oppressed. Mm -hmm. So messianic rumors meant political deliverance for Jews who were mistreated by the Roman government. Mm -hmm. But the Jewish religious leaders, mm -hmm. the self-righteous scribes and Pharisees, mm -hmm. were benefiting from their alliance mm -hmm. with the Romans. And Jesus was a threat to their political privileges. Not only was Jesus a threat to their political privileges, but he was a threat to their claim as biblical exegetes. Yes, 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 yes. They didn't want Jesus to usurp their authority as one who had a greater understanding of the law they claimed to understand. Why? In previous verses, Jesus mentioned that if you understood the law of Moses, you would have realized that the law testified of me. So the scribes and the Pharisees, in their attempt to derail the very Son of God, used a woman, an honest, uh, used a woman as an accessory to the demise of her own Savior. Wow! 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 Okay. Okay. But is there anybody here who can lift up holy hands and give God thanks yeah. that the grace place, though not the perfect place, yeah. is the best place? Yeah. Yeah. You should be glad that the grace place does not drag your past yeah. before you yeah. for the world to see like a cinema screen. Can we just celebrate our pastors? Yeah, we can. can we celebrate our Lord. leaders? Can we celebrate our teachers yes, for yes, not condemning yes, God's yes. people? Do I Thank have at Lord. least three people up in here yes, who can testify yes. that we serve a God who yes. records, yes. a God who restores, yes. a God who yes. redeems, yes. and a God who does not condemn? Yes. Maybe I'm the only person in here who can give God thanks that we have pastors, yes. that we have teachers, yes. Yes. that we yes. have leaders who are concerned about your spiritual Thank you, edification. Thank you, Lord. Bless your name, God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So the religious elites continued in verse 5. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? This question, child of God, may I submit to you, this question is significant. Not only were Jewish leaders trying to test Jesus, but they were trying to undermine his authority yeah. as a teacher. Yeah. Yeah. Back then, it was a custom, as is today, to ask manipulative questions to garner a particular response. So the Jews thought Jesus had two options. He could recommend stoning the woman, but in that case, he would be legislating against, he would be going against Roman law, which did not require the death penalty in a situation like this due to the strategic absence of the male. You must understand that it was a setup. If Jesus rejected the stoning of this woman, he would be neglecting God's law in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, which implies both male and female caught in adultery should be perished. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman. Where was the male? I'm going to give you time for you to think about it. So Jesus decided in verse 7 to stoop down and wrote on the ground with his finger as if he never heard. Now the reason this is significant is because Jesus would have lost the support of the people who came to learn from him. Also, the Jewish leaders would have a reason to accuse him. 
they backed up my Jesus against the ropes, mm -hmm. but they did not realize he was simply doing the rope a -dope. You don't know what the rope a -dope is? Ask Muhammad Ali. Ask. Muhammad Ali would stay in the corner of the ring and take all those jabs. But what his opponents did not know yes. is that he was just wearing them out. Yes, and I can just imagine, based off my sanctified imagination, uh -huh. coupled with intellectual stimulation, yes, the scribes and the Pharisees backed up Jesus in a corner. Uh -huh. And Jesus had to take all these intellectual jabs. But what they did not know is that Jesus was waiting for the opportune time to land his spiritual haymaker. And I love this, beloved, because John not only highlights that the scribes and the Pharisees prioritized public castigation over spiritual edification, but he helps us to understand that we serve a savior who provides redemptive yes. prote protection. Yes. Beloved, what do you do when your savior appears to be quiet? <laughs> Could it be that your condemnation and your humiliation is not about you, but about the God who is being tested through you? Could it be that your could it be that your character isn't the only character that's on trial? They persisted in getting a response from the master teacher. So Jesus straightened up and said to the scribes and Pharisees, He, masculine, who is without sin among you, scribes and Pharisees, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. In verse 8, Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground. Now we don't know what exactly he wrote on the ground. Some scholars believe he was writing the sins of the woman, Others argue he did what he did was considering forensic practice. But verse 9 is what caught my attention, Dr. Williams. When they heard this, they began leaving one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone, and the woman where she was, in the center of the courtyard. I have been reading this text, Nehemi, thinking that the older ones referred to both male and female. Yeah. <laughs> but grammatically in the Greek, that's not true. Come on. All right. Come on. But upon further investigation, I realized the older ones referred to males who were members of the Israelite Sanhedrin. They were the ones who left first. Also, these were Christian leaders, preferably between the ages of 50 and 60. So when Jesus told them, he who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her, Jesus was exposing the private lives of those leaders, implying they were struggling with deeds that they still struggle with. Mercy. They dealt with a broken, vulnerable woman harshly. Mercy. So Jesus had to humble them publicly. Mercy. Come here, Grace Place. Be careful how you condemn on, people publicly. On, because when you condemn people publicly at the expense of the vulnerable, yes, yes. you reserve the right yes. for your Savior yes. to humble you come publicly. On, and can I give you some advice? Whenever you decide to, whenever you decide to condemn someone, please have enough money in your bank account so you can purchase two caskets, one for yourself and the person you intend to condemn. But you should be grateful that our God is not just a savior, he's not just a healer, he's not just a redeemer, he's not just a restorer, but he's a defender. He will fight your battle. He will make your enemies your footstool. And is there anybody here this morning who can celebrate the fact that you have leaders who care about your spiritual edification while serving a God who provides redemptive protection? Thank you, Lord. 
Now all the religious elites have left the woman's courtyard. The woman who I believe was stricken by shame, guilt, and humiliation was left alone with the ultimate revelation of God. She was left with the presence and essence of life at his absolute core. She was left with she was left with a man. She was left with a That's all right. That's all right. Now all the religious elites have left the woman at the courtyard. The woman who was who I believe was stricken by shame, guilt, and humiliation was left alone with the ultimate revelation of God. She was left with the presence and essence of life at his absolute core. She was left with a man who spoke and turned water into wine. She was left with a no-nonsense Jew who overthrew temples in the, te in the te temple area. If that wasn't good enough, beloved, she was left with a master teacher who questioned the, th the theology of Nicodemus. If that didn't move you, she was left with the man who became the seventh man for the Samaritan Wonder Woman. She was now in the presence of a healer who healed an official son with his word. She was in the presence of a healer who commanded the man at the pool of Bethesda to pick up his mat and walk. She was in the presence of a man who took pleasure in educating Jews who had their PhDs in systematic theology. She was in the presence of the man who declared, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate for the sheep. And I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the vine. And may I submit to you sometimes, Jesus, who is the center, must get you alone and a place where you are at the center of your predicament. So in verse 10, Jesus straightened up and asked a rhetorical question to this unfortunately victimized woman. Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She replied in verse 11, no one, Lord. And Jesus responded, I do not condemn you either. Go, go, from now on, sin no longer. Now you missed it, so let me repeat it. Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She replied in verse 11, No one, Lord. And Jesus responded, I do not condemn you thank either. You, thank you, thank you. Go. Yes. From now on, do not sin any longer. <laughs> I like that because John helps us to realize that though we have a responsibility for the spiritual edification of his people, mm -hmm. though we serve a God that provides redemptive protection, mm -hmm. we have a savior who does not condemn, but grants willing absolution mm -hmm. and expects immediate implementation. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In other words, yeah. Jesus frees this woman of her guilt and shame. Uh -huh. He frees her from public humiliation and condemnation. She is left alone with Jesus and he gives two commands. He commands her to go and from now on do not sin any longer. This is not the condition of grace, but the proper response to it. It is the liberating work of Jesus doing something that did not imply the excuse of sin. That's good. That's good. That's Jesus good. always right. demanded the transformation yes. of life, yes. Yes. the turning yes. away from sin. Yes. And the question I'd like to pose to you before I close, have you ever been in a situation where it was just you and your Lord and Savior? Could it be that the courtyard is an opportunity for you to understand the magnitude of God's grace? Could it be that your secrecy is the window to God's divine intimacy? I like what Mama Ellen said. She states in the Ministry of Health and Healing 
This was to her the beginning of a new life, a life of purity and peace devoted to God. In the uplifting of this fallen soul, Jesus performed a greater miracle than in healing the most grievous physical disease. He cured the spiritual malady that leads to eternal death. This penitent woman became one of the most steadfast followers. With self-sacrificing love and devotion, she showed her gratitude for his loving, for, for his loving, forgiving mercy. The world had only contempt and scorn for this erring woman, but the sinless one, watch this, pitied her weakness and reached to her at a helping hand. While the hypocritical Pharisees condemned her, Jesus urged her, go and sin no more. When you meet God's word, it challenges you to move. Yes, it does. Yes, All right, let me illustrate. Yes, so yes, I was a freshman in undergrad and I, and I decided to study biology. But unfortunately, that did not go so well for me because I was failing miserably because my heart was not in the program. Mm -hmm. So I decided to switch my major from biology to actuarial science. I graduated from undergrad, made my own money, life was good, until I, I was impressed to apply for the MDiv at Andrews. And I said to my mom in the congregation, if I struggled in undergrad, why should I believe that I would do well at the master's level? She said, Mark, that was the past. Go, you'll do well. I'm like, what are you talking about? She said, Mark, you'll be fine. Go and do well. But it hit me when the Holy Spirit gave me this revelation. My mom was not judging or assessing me based on where I was. She was prescribing my projected reality. So when she spoke words of life, I couldn't help but get good grades. I couldn't help but spend more time in the world. I couldn't help but build my vocabulary. She said it and I just acted on it. Is there anybody here who believes that God's word can change the trajectory of your life? Is there anybody here who knows that God's word has creative power? Do I have at least two or three people here who can testify? I'm a stand on his word. I'm a feast on his word. I'm a meditate on this word. And you must understand that God's word does not content, condemn, but grants willing absolution and expects immediate implementation. Now, I'm not sure if you noticed in verse 11 of this pericope, Jesus said to the woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? Jesus says, she said, no one, Lord. This woman recognized that she should have received the death penalty. But she was intelligent enough to realize that she needed a savior. This woman recognized Jesus as Lord. She recognized him as the son of God. She recognized him as the savior of the world. Why? She recognized him as savior because she experienced him for herself. She understood what it means to be delivered. Now you may be wondering, where is Mark going with this? Remember, there was a certain group of people called the scribes and the Pharisees. The scribes were all the executive secretaries of the Seventh-day Adventist church. They had excellent administrative skills. They were great at teaching and interpreting the Torah and other Jewish literature. They were political advisors and diplomats of our church. And don't get me started with the Pharisees. They had PhDs and THDs. They were the systematic, theology, systematic theologians of our day. They were separated divided and distinguished from other groups. Yeah. They had all the knowledge and didn't realize that the Mosaic law pointed to Jesus. 
They were so educated that their education became their incomprehension. Please don't think I'm against, I'm, I'm anti-education. Get your education. I'm all for that. But sometimes on the journey of faith, it's not what you know. It's who you know. And that's why your Bible says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Excuse me, Jill, but I heard a word from Paul that now there is no condemnation in Jesus Christ my Lord. But excuse me, I heard the songwriter say, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. When I stood condemned to death, he took my place. And now that I live and breathe in freedom, with each breath of life I take, I'm loved and forgiven, backed with the living. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And God woke me up this morning to remind the church at Grace Place, she was caught, but she was not condemned. She was caught, but she was not condemned. She was caught. But she was not condemned. Thank you, Lord. Bless your name, oh God. Thank you, Lord. Bless your name, God. Thank you, God. Bless your name, God. She was caught. Thank you, God. Bless your name, God. Bless your name, God. Bless your name, God. Bless she your name, God. Thank you, God. Bless your name. But not condemned. Thank you, God. No, I'm not so sure if any of you have been caught. Oh my God. Thank you. But I am sure most of us have been condemned. Yeah. Whether that may be from friends or family members or persons closest to you. Persons in your inner circle or your outer circle. You may not have been caught, but you were condemned wrongfully. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Yes, Thank you. Now there is no condemnation you, in Jesus you, Christ, God. your Lord. You. And you may not be caught, but you may be living in the past and you're now in the present. Mm. And that is preventing you from going in the future. And God woke me up this morning to tell you that you have not been Thank condemned. You, you have not been condemned. Thank you, God. He is not interested in condemning you. Mm -hmm. He wants to give you life. Amen. In the book of John, life does not only represent eternal life, mm -hmm. but he prom Jesus promises that we can experience that life here right now. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And I'm just want, I just want to know if there are persons here who need prayer. You may have been condemned by persons closest to you. Persons may have hurt you, intentionally or unintentionally. But I'm just going to ask you to stand for those of you who are in need of prayer. For those of you who feel like throwing in the towel. For those of you who have been humiliated and rejected publicly or privately. I'm going to ask my homiletics professor to come and pray on behalf of us, that God helps us to understand that we have not been condemned. Yes. Jesus is not in the business of condemning people. Amen. That's a false theology. It's not true. If you don't believe, actually, in this text, the scribes and the Pharisees didn't believe. They were the ones condemned. Not because of what they did, but because of their unbelief. Yeah. Wow. Mm. 
because of their unbelief. They knew, they had all this knowledge. They had everything. They were experts of the law and they still missed the Messiah. And if they knew the law that well, they would have realized that Jesus was the fulfillment of the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law pointed back to Jesus and they missed it. They did not believe him. And that is why they wanted to kill him. They didn't believe. And I'm just here to tell you this morning that you have not been condemned. And God came to die for you and he wants to set you free. So I'm going to pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen, Lord. We are so grateful that we are not condemned by you. But we are incredibly grateful that we've been caught by you. Oh, Lord, we've been running, running and hiding. But we've been caught by you. And who better to be caught by than the one who is pledged to save us. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Lord God. Lay your hand upon every yes, single one of us yes, who God. admits that we've been yes, caught. Yes, and for those who are still running, catch them, Jesus. Yes, Throw the net high and yes, wide yes, and catch them, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. For they need to know Amen. that they should stop running and hiding because there is therefore no condemnation. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.